Morning. Um, so as I said, we've got Jen Hammers today. Jen manages the Water and Marine Program at NRM South in Tassie. Jen has worked extensively in STEM education and marine NRM to develop partnerships and deliver outcomes for community, industry and the environment. She has a research background in fisheries biology and spends much of her time by the sea. Lucky Jen. Um, so today Jen's going to be talking about the NRM South Blue Carbon Project they're supporting. The project will involve removing a levy to restore the habitat values of a salt marsh near Richmond in southern Tasmania and will hopefully also store lots of carbon in what will be one of um, the first ERF registered blue carbon projects in Australia. So thanks, Jen. Thank you for having me. Um, now I'm just going to quickly share my screen um does that come up it's not doing its thing yet. okay there's always a hitch in there <laughs> oh it's okay we've had a number of people sharing their notes lately the last few ones i've been to so so we'll bear with you for a minute jen that should oh look it looks like it's coming up now great okay perfect Excellent. Um, so, uh, first of all, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I'm presenting from today um, in Luchawita, Tasmania. I'm in Nipaluna, Hobart, and on the lands of the Muanina people. And I would like to pay my respects to their elders past and present. Um, I would also like to acknowledge my colleague, Grace Isdale, who couldn't be with us today. Unfortunately, she's unwell, but she has put together this fantastic presentation that I'm going to make my way through and I hope that I do it justice because she, Grace always gives a great presentation. So um, as Rachel said, when she introduced me, I just I wanted to share with you um, our Blue Carbon Ecosystem Restoration Project. Um, we're restoring temperate salt marsh community here in Southeast Tasmania. Okay, uh, so a couple of years ago, we were successful in getting one of the Australian government's Fish Habitat Restoration Program grants, which were specifically designed to restore fish habitat for the purpose of recreational fishing to rebuild fish stocks and engage the rec fishing community. And so we, with our partners, identified this site not far from the Hobart Airport, if you're familiar with Hobart, uh, where we had an opportunity to remove a levy to restore 65 hectares of stranded salt marsh. And it quickly became apparent to us that we could do that project within the time, but there was actually so much more we could achieve at that site. Um, and so when the Australian government's Blue Carbon Ecosystem Restoration Grants became av available kind of this time last year, uh, we, we put forward this area and had leveraged the grant that we had to be able to continue the work that we're doing. And by doing that, we're going to be able to come away with a much better understanding of the diverse range of benefits that can be achieved through this scale of blue carbon ecosystem restoration. So our project partners in this grant, or both grants, are the Australian government obviously, uh, the University of Tasmania, a local company called Blue Carbon Services, um, and the property owner who's there, Will, um, has been extremely supportive of this project through the Fish Habitat Restoration Program grant too. We also work with uh, Ausfish. So first up, just a little bit about temperate salt marsh community, if you're not familiar with it. I understand, you know, everyone's here from different parts of the country. Um, but it is a, it's a temperate community. It's, it's uh, listed as um, under threat. It's really significant fish nursery habitat. Uh, it has enormous biodiversity. It contributes organic materials, so food, nutrient matter, to estuaries. It's also a significant blue carbon ecosystem in as much as it stores it stores carbon in the sediments uh, in its vegetation and has a relationship that we'd like to better understand between subtitle seagrass communities too which is another blue carbon ecosystem it's a really important system for its environmental services in as much as it provides coastal resilience against floods and sea level sea level rise in addition to the other services it provides around nutrient cycling and um, being habitat for fish and birds. So, as I said, if you're familiar with Hobart at all and you've ever been to the airport here, um, this, is, this is our site. You fly straight over it. Um, 
and just a little bit more about it. The, the property we're working on is called Richmond Park. You can see it there, just as that little sort of red outline. It sits adjacent to the Pittwater Orielton Lagoon Ramsar site. Um, it was really obvious that this was an area that could be restored by removing a levee to restore that 65 hectares of stranded salt marsh. From all the aerial imagery and what we know about salt marsh, it was just a really clear site where we could have an impact. Um, and also we have a good relationship that was existing with the property owner there. So all of these things you know, added up to, um, to make sense to go to this site to, to undertake the restoration. So what we're aiming to do and the activities that we'll do are to, we want to understand the benefits of salt marsh restoration at a landscape scale. We also want to understand the co-benefits arising from that restoration. And specifically, we're looking at things like climate, biodiversity, livelihood co-benefits, but we know that there will be more that we want to measure as well. We want to use this site to apply the tidal method for blue carbon ecosystem restoration. And so the types of activities that we'll be doing, will be removing that levee to restore the natural hydrology. So restoring the, the, the smooth flow or the, the slow flow rather of, of tides to this site. <coughs> Excuse me. We want to fence the site. So it currently has um, sheep can access it. Um, and that's why it was stranded in the first place was to make the land available for sheep farming. I don't know that the sheep actually especially enjoy being on salt marsh or eating it. Um, so I don't know how successful it is in terms of um, being an area of the farm, um, but we, do, we are going to exclude the livestock there. We'll also undertake some weed removal. There's some significant threats in terms of weeds at this site. Um, and we want to revegetate around the fringe of the site um, to try and improve the microclimate for both the farm itself that's still operating and the salt marsh. And out of all of this, through all these aims and activities, we want to build the capacity of people locally to be able to undertake blue carbon ecosystem restoration and also to understand what's involved in applying the method and doing the environmental accounting associated with it. So we appreciate that there's, there's actually a lot to grow and learn in that space in our local community. So just an aerial view of the site and, and what we'll be doing. So you can even see from this one on the outside, on the water side, so this is the Coal River flowing into the Pitwater Orielton Lagoon. You can see sort of that, that darker shade of salt marsh and then looking inside, you can see the really dehydrated patch of salt marsh in there. So at that red line, that's the levee that we'll be taking out. And you can see around it the proposed fencing um, that we'll be doing on that site. So just by contrast, um, this is an older photo of the site. Um, where the, I think the levee, you can see it's sort of in place there, but it's not fully cutting everything off. And you can see the extent of the salt marsh is so much greater in this photo. And I don't, Grace's notes haven't appeared right in front of me, but I believe this is from the 1960s. And just another photo here again. So this is how it looks today. Um, this is a, a drone image and you can see quite clearly that levee across the deeper part of the channel there that that's what we're going to be taking out. And just again from a different perspective, sort of on the, the left hand side, I suppose, the seaward side, you can see that really healthy um, salt marsh there. You can see the, the, um, the sort of pinky, reddy colour and the green that's indicating good healthy salt marsh. Whereas you can see on the other side where that levee is that um, it's, it's dehydrated. It's actually where the water has come through breaches in the levee, it's, it's swamped. Um, and so it's, I guess it's drowned the salt marsh almost. And what happens in, under those events is you get really anoxic environments too. So some of the environmental services that we'll be measuring or, or benefits, I suppose, will be around how we can improve um, other, other emissions associating from anoxic environments that are forming over the salt marsh. It's just, um, Grace has got a video here, I hope it's playing. Um, what's happening out there over time, the tides trying to do what they naturally do, is that we're getting these breaches in the levee. And what's happening 
as a result of that are these really, really deep channels that are forming that are actually eroding the salt marsh and completely undermining its structure and the structure of the sediments out there too. So by restoring this levee, hopefully what we'll achieve is um, improvements in that erosion so you don't get these really deep channels that are actually scouring away and killing the salt marsh as well. She's got another one here. We won't you can see those deep channels that are developing through it. So these are breaches in the levee. And another one here, just, just this one's in. This is the levee itself that this photo is taken from, but you can see that build-up of um, algae that really thrives in high-nutrient environments. So ideally, that wouldn't be there in a, in a healthy salt marsh. So we'll be measuring those impacts too. So this bit of the levee where Grace is standing to take this photo, this is the bit that's going to be coming out. So to actually achieve this work, it's been quite a bit of... Um, it's been a lot of preparation, I suppose. You would all be familiar with the types of permits and so forth that we have to have to get to undertake this kind of work. So for us, um, the three NRM regions operating in Tasmania, we have a joint permit working group with the Tasmanian government agencies that we can take our projects to that working group and say, can you please advise us on what permits we need to undertake our work? Um, so we, we use that working group to help inform us, but we've had to get um, permits from Aboriginal Heritage Tasmania. So this particular site is really important culturally. Um, and so we've had to, we want to work with the Tasmanian Aboriginal community to understand how we can undertake this restoration work in a sensitive and meaningful way. We are also working with the local council at the site, the Clarence City Council, um, to assess whether we need a development application to remove this levy. And at the moment, it doesn't look like we do, but it's an ongoing conversation with them. We're working with the Environmental Protection Authority in Tasmania. Again, we don't need a development application, but we do need to advise them of the work we're doing so that they can inform us if we need to go those next steps. And our Natural Resources and Environment Tasmania Water Branch, we've been consulting with them too to understand what permits are required when you remove a levy because it may or may not, depending on how close it is to the tidal zone, come under our water act as a dam. So there's been quite a bit for us to learn about and understand in undertaking this scale of restoration for this particular ecological community. Just a little bit more on the Aboriginal heritage assessment work that we've been doing. Um, we've worked with an Aboriginal heritage officer who's person appointed by the community um, who can speak on behalf of the community and advise us on the types of methods that we need to use to undertake our on-ground works, including, including the levy removal, um, to ensure that we have low impact and we are um, being sensitive to the cultural heritage at that site. Um, this was, as I said, a really important site pre-colonisation. Um, there is evidence of its use out there. Um, and so we are hoping through this project that there will also be an opportunity to enable the Tasmanian Aboriginal people to, to have access to that site in the future. Um, I mentioned we've been working with the Clarence City Council. So again, this was around the development permit. Um, just you know, a note for others who might be undertaking this kind of work that we've actually had to really engage the earthworks contractor that we'll be using in this process as well. Um, so, you know, it, that was something we hadn't sort of anticipated, but um, that's, you know, something that we're doing. We're learning from this project all the time. Um, I, I mentioned the EPA. We, we don't need a permit from them, but we may be referred to them. Um, and this was an interesting one. I mentioned the um, Natural Resources and Environment Tasmania, our government department, We'd sort of contacted them and they'd said, no, there's, there's nothing that you need from us until we had a, an article on the front page of one of our local papers and then we got a phone call from somebody in the water branch there to say, um, better come in for a chat. They might, <laughs> you might have actually triggered an act. And look, you know, I have to say that through this whole process, we've had a lot of support from these different agencies to undertake restoration. They really are very interested in seeing the outcomes and the benefits associated with this project, but it's definitely been a learning process. Um, you might have noticed just on the way through, Grace has provided these excellent photos and here she is having a marvellous time out um, doing fish sampling and I get to sign her papers to say that she's okay to go. She's, she's the one out there doing the work. 
So um, as a baseline for these projects, particularly the Blue Carbon Ecosystem Restoration one, we have installed water loggers to understand how the depth of the water over the salt marsh is going to change as a result of restoration um, and what that means in terms of flood mitigation. So these are the water loggers being installed. We've undertaken um, invertebrate surveys, bird surveys, fish surveys as well. So there's, they're out there often at night collecting fish um, and seeing how the fish are using it and under, trying to understand, particularly for the recreationally and commercially important fish species, how they're using the land out there or the, the water. It just you know, more beautiful photos of them collecting fish. So moving into sort of what we'll be measuring as a result of the Blue Carbon Ecosystem Restoration Grant, um, there's currently a tender available with the Australian government that's currently advertised um, for a, an environmental economic accountant to work with us at the project level to assess the benefits of this restoration. And specifically what they're looking for is um, for the EEA to apply the same methodology before and after the restoration, and that might be, you know, multiple years after the restoration so that we can understand what has changed and what the co-benefits are. So aligned with that, we'll have environmental accounts developed. A how-to guide has been developed by the Blue Carbon Lab at Deakin University, and that will guide the, um, the environmental economic accounting across both this project and the other four projects that were funded across Australia. Um, and so that will be applied in this. And we have an opportunity uh, working with the environmental economic accountant who gets the tender to, um, I suppose, refine the methods that are in that how-to guide um, and improve what's already happening and also to create and propose new methods for measuring the different um, benefits arising from this sort of scale restoration. So that's, that's all from me. Um, so thank you for having me. I just wanted to note too, I, I perhaps met some of you at the Carbon Farming Workshop in Western Australia and maybe some of you might have one of the other four projects and um, in, under this grant and if so, you've probably heard Pete give this presentation before and thank you for your patience. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Jen. That was great and um, God, spectacular environment you guys are working in, in <laughs> down there. And um, yep. yeah, really, you know, best of luck to you in restoring it. Um, do we have some questions for Jen? Feel free to put your hand up and unmute. I think Amanda down the bottom has unmuted. Uh, yes, I just missed the very start. Um, you probably mentioned the area of the the restoration area. Could you just tell me that again, please? Yeah, so it, it's 65 hectares of the temperate salt marsh community. But having said that, we'll also measure our impacts on the adjacent seagrass community and sort of the super tidal fring fringing community too. But in terms of the salt marsh, it's 65 hectares. Oh, that's great. That's a very, can be a very productive um, fish yeah. habitat area. Yep, absolutely. Great. Right. Thanks, Amanda. Jason, you've got your hand up. Yeah, uh, thanks, Rach. And Jen, that was so good. Really thanks. good project. <laughs> um, just curious on estimated carbon stocks. Uh, has that been assessed yet or is that to come? It, look, it, it is to come. So we're, we've done a, a really rough, um, you know, throw the, throw the numbers into the into the blue cam calculator um, and I'm sorry I don't actually it was some time ago I did that and I don't have I don't have them in front of me look they are significant um, but in terms of, of working with the landholder around applying the um, the title restoration method and going through the ERF registering it that's still something that we're doing yeah. um, so all of you would be aware that there are permanence periods associated with that and this is the first time this method's been used in the country. Um, so our landholder that we're working with, he really wants to take his time to understand the implications. Yeah. And there's actually not much capacity out there to support him in that decision making yet. Um, so we're, we're just taking it slowly. And I think, um, yeah, once we have a, a, you know, we actually get out there and start taking more of the baseline measurements, we're going to have a much better understanding of what that total carbon gain is. Right, and the, yeah. and the landholder will attain or get the accus. Is that right? 
Yeah, if he chooses yeah. to. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And look, I have to say he has stressed with us a, a, the whole time that it's actually the restoration outcomes that yeah. he's most interested in. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, you know, it's I totally understand why this is such a new process that he's, he's got really got to learn and we've got to learn um, yeah. what it means. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and and funding investment has that just been covered through the funding that you've you've got, or do, is there other investors? Um, just through the funding that we have. Um, so as I said, it was the initial fish ha- fish habitat grant, and they were pretty limited in what was available there. And then the the blue carbon ecosystem one, and then additional funding for the um, environmental economic accountant tender. Oh, yeah. Yep. 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 Right. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Right, have we got more questions for Jen? I've got a question, um, and you might have already answered it, Jen, but mm-hmm. it, it sounds like you guys are basically doing the accounting yourself through the um, blue carbon calculator. Is that right? Like you're not working with a separate project developer in this no. space? No, so, so that'll be done through the, through the tender process, through the EEA. Yeah. Having said that, because the um, calculator is a publicly available resource, we just thought, well, that's give it a run <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah i mean it's you know it's it's actually really easy just to, it's just in an excel spreadsheet and you just download it and yeah yep. and is it based on a model over time for how much carbon you're going to sequester like is that how the accounts are how the accuse are generated like does it, does yeah it just, so it's, it's yep all based on models yeah yep. great mm. yeah it's um yeah it looks like an amazing project um do we have any other questions for jen Looks like that might be it. But um, thanks so much for joining us and for presenting on that. Obviously, yes. we'll hope you can stick around for a bit longer. For, um, I'll stick around for a bit longer. Yeah, <laughs> fantastic. Yeah, it's, and um, I was yeah, just, really exciting, yeah. I'll just go back um, to that first screen. Um, so Grace apologises that she can't be here. It's not her fault. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to share again. I can put it in the chat, actually. Um, there's down the bottom of the screen there, Grace's contact details. And, of course, anybody's welcome to contact me. Um, I'm really very keen to um, exchange our knowledge and learning with others and I know that there are many of you in this um, community of practice who you've got experience applying some of the other methods um, and I just would love to learn more about how you or what you've learned from that particularly in working with landholders so yeah leave it at that. Right thanks Jen. Thanks.